I've always believed that Chekhov was more lighthearted of reads from the Russian lit, but it only speaks to the fact that I have either not read his plays or completely blocked it out of my memory, because, oh boy, the level of hopelessness in some of them could put Dostoevsky to shame. Anton Chekhov was born January 17, 1860, in Taganrog, that's a provincial town. Uh, he was born in a merchant family. He was the third of six children. Uh, the family life was rather strict. Uh, the family life was rather strict in addition to the studies in the church choir. The children were expected to help out in the father's grocery store. The father was not that successful, however. 1876, he went bankrupt and the family had to flee to Moscow to escape the creditors. Anton was left behind to finish his studies at the gymnasium and he was also tasked with uh, selling the family possessions and sending the earned money to Moscow. In order to support himself, he would earn money by tutoring and around the same time he also began to write his uh, first short stories and his first play. 1879, Anton finished his studies at the gymnasium with rather mediocre grades and moved to Moscow to begin his studies at the Moscow University. He chose to study medicine. His first literary publication happened the same year in Strekaza magazine. He published his first short story uh, with a lengthy title now shortened to a letter to a learned neighbor. He was an apt student. Uh, during his studies, he already began to practice medicine in Voskresensk, where he would later become a full-fledged doctor, having completed his studies. And he was promoted to the chief of medicine in that hospital, 1884. Throughout his life, Chekhov said that he was a doctor first, i.e. he was married to the medicine and uh, literature was just a mistress. However, it's somewhat fair to say that he was an average doctor, but uh, obviously became a literary genius. This attitude didn't stop him from writing, though. Uh, early on, he got published in various humorous magazines under a multitude of pseudonyms. He had about 50 of them. The most famous one would be Antosha Chekhante. By 1885, he already is well known as an author of humorous short stories. His talent got noticed famously by a writer named Dmitry Grigorovich, who wrote him a note that was complimentary but also scathing at the same time, that boiled down to you're wasting your talent. Because the humorous stories were believed to be a lesser art form at the time and thus not worthy of Chekhov's talent. Chekhov starts to make more connections in the literary world. For example, thanks to a critic named Suvorin, Chekhov wrote and published some of his more lengthy pieces in Suvorin's uh, magazine Nové Vreme. 1887, Chekhov starts to dab into more serious themes and subject matters. For example, a novella by him, The Step, uh, that was influenced by his journey through Priyazov territory. That's the where Taganrog is. 1890, uh, Chekhov took up a more serious and dangerous trip to Sakhalin Island, uh, at the time a prisoner's island. There is no obvious reason for him to take up the trip. Some say that he was so shaken up by the brother's death that he needed to escape. Uh, others say that it was his civic duty that drove him to it. Uh, the trip to the island itself was quite dangerous. There, are, there were no trains uh, through Siberia at the time, so he had to travel for weeks by carriages at best, but he did make it there. On Sakhalin, he spoke to inmates, including political prisoners. He performed a census, and upon his return, he wrote a book called Sakhalin Island that described the everyday life of prisoners and the hardships of that life. And while Chekhov was not either sent there by authorities nor in any shape or form authorized to do any of this, it's thanks to him and the publicity that he brought to this issue that the living conditions of the prisoners were actually improved there and some of the harder punishments got abolished. Upon his return, Chekhov installed himself in Moscow, uh, but he also did travel uh, around Europe quite a bit. The house that uh, Chekhov occupied in Moscow is now a museum. You can actually go there and check it out. They don't have too many of Chekhov's possessions 
instance, for example, just this table there, but it's open to visitors and they perform excursions there so you can learn a little bit about Chekhov's life. 1892, Chekhov purchased an estate near Moscow in the village of Melikhov. There he opened medical practice, but he also built roads, schools, and generally tried to help out the villagers as much as he could. In Melikhov's, he wrote some of his most famous works, for example, The Seagull, Ward Number no. 6, The Man in the Case, and uh, more, around 40 notable works. 1898, he met his wife, Olga Knipper. Up to that point, his dalliances were not lengthy and never even led to an engagement. He's said to have been incredibly popular with women, not only for being the famous playwright, but apparently he was also quite tall, good-looking, and with a deep, soothing voice. You can actually see it somewhat in this portrait of him done by his brother, but the most famous one that Chekhov actually hated. Uh, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe not so much. Chekhov in general did not hold women in the highest standards. He, in his notes, there are rather scathing opinions on women that he had, especially the European women, but I don't think that he held much more respect for the Russian women. But in general, he was a cad, but <laughs> his relationships with women were rather uh, questionable at best. But with, uh, with Olga Knipper, they managed to establish some kind of a routine that worked for the both of them. In his late years, uh, his tuberculosis that he was suffering from for, throughout his whole life was flaring up more and more. So by doctor's advice, he went and installed himself in Yalta, that's Crimea. Olga Knipper was the prima of the Moscow Art Theatre, so remained back here in Moscow. It is said that she had uh, affairs, including one with the famous director and friend uh, Nimirovich Danchenko, but the relationship with Chekhov remained loving until the very end. While they were apart, they were exchanging notes and letters uh, daily, sometimes twice a day. I think in uh, that small time of a separation, they sent something like 800 notes back and forth, letters and telegrams. So yeah. Chekhov's health, however, was not improving. So on doctor's advice, along with Olga, they went to Badenweiler in Germany, where 1904, he died peacefully in his sleep, age 44. Talking about Chekhov's work requires a lot more than a 30-minute YouTube video. He's never produced like a full-fledged novel, but he wrote so many short stories and plays. And if you look at some of his short stories, they're literally like wisps of stories, like three pages long. But that's actually where Chekhov really shines. He said that when you write a story, chop off the ending, chop off the beginning, and that's when you get a real story. Think about it. In any of his stories, he just drops you into the middle of a situation, whatever it may be, but he also gives you enough clues for you to figure out what's going on. He does not believe in lengthy expositions, the description of scenery and all of that. The medium does not really allow for it, but more importantly, Chekhov doesn't. It also speaks to the Chekhov's gun principle, uh, that every detail needs to serve a purpose. If you introduce a loaded gun in Act 1, it needs to be shot at some point during the story, otherwise what was the point of it? It needs to be removed. There are some critics of the principle, famously Hemingway, who believed in atmospheric elements, but it really works for what Chekhov is trying to do. When you story is like three pages long and you have not given any lengthy exposition as to who, what and why, every detail becomes crucial. And Chekhov is really brilliant at it. There is no word out of place. It adds flavor to the story. There are two facets to Chekhov's writing. There are his short stories and his plays. Internationally, I think he's more well known for the latter, but I wanted to cover both because there are both interesting and both both worthy of a mention. It did, however, take me a little while to choose the titles. I was originally going to talk about The Cherry Orchard or even The Seagull, because I believe they are more famous. But as far as plays goes, I've chosen Uncle Vanya, because it left quite a dent in my soul as I reread it. So that's the one we're going to be talking about. And from the short stories perspective, I'm going to stick with The Man in the Case. It's probably one of the more famous ones, but my favorite is actually Chameleon. It's literally three pages long. Just go ahead and read it. It's quite fun and still quite relevant to this day, so you could find it amusing. We'll start 
with the men in the case. It was written in 1898. There are conflicting reports on whether or not there is a prototype to the character in the story. Some say that it is the Taganrog Gymnasium inspector called Diakonov. But some disprove it, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter not, is it? <laughs> it's rather hard to retell a short story, but let's give it a go. A narrator, a teacher named Birkin, tells a story to his travel companion about a fellow teacher that he knew called Belikov. The man would not come out of his shell, no matter the weather, he would wear a coat, galoshe, and an umbrella, which would also be in its own case, and thus the public dubbed him a man in the case. Metaphorically, he was also in a case, he loved rules and regulations, filling out forms and such, and he would always worry about the potential repercussions of any given action. And moreover, he expected others to follow the same principles. He would drone on and on about it, like, what, what if something happens? What if something terrible happens? And if somebody else broke the rules, he would point it out, and according to Birkin, with his sighs and whining, he would force others this to do his bidding, i.e. either follow the rules or punish those who don't. So the whole town got under his rule, they would be too afraid to do anything that he would be disapproving of, and thus he held the town in his grip. The conflict arrived when a new teacher got into town and brought his sister along with them, and somehow the town got it into their heads that it would be a good idea to marry our Belikov to this new woman in town because she did not necessarily show any dislike towards him. And they managed to persuade Belikov that he needed to do that as well. But someone has drawn a character of Belikov along with Varya that upset him greatly. He went to see Kovalenko's in order to, I don't know, apologize, presumably, but he saw them cycling around town. At that, something he dis he's disapproving of and something that he finds inappropriate. And that's what he said to the brother, to Kovalenko. Uh, he, he did not take it very well. The argument ensued and he pushed Belikov down the flight of stairs. Uh, Belikov was fine, but Varya saw him falling down the stairs and she found the situation hilarious and she laughed at him. And that's actually what brought Belikov down, because that's, that's an insult, but it also the humiliation of all of it. So he went home, locked himself up, and in a month's time he was dead. At the funeral, the townsfolk are rather happy that he's gone. They think that they're finally free of his reign. But uh, after the funeral, their life went on the same way that it was before i.e. nobody's found the freedom that they were seeking, that they still stuck to the same rules and regulations that, the, that Belikov installed upon them. The narrator finishes the story and his companion Ivan Ivanovich says that living a lie is a case of its own and people should be breaking free of it, but the narrator Burkin does not really want to hear any of it and cuts him off and that's where the conversation ends, along with the story. Narratively, it's a story within the story. Chekhov once again uses the same uh, dropping reader into the situation method because as we are introduced to our narrator and his companion, they are just coming back from the hunt and stopping for the night. We have not seen the hunt. We are not going to see them after this night. It's just this conversation in the night. The story within is a satirical representation of the main point. The character of Belikov is intentionally hyperbolic. The descriptions of his in-the-case nature are rather comical and hilarious. The conflict arrives with the newcomer in town who does not follow the same rules, and he openly says it. How can you live like this? I don't understand, he used to say to us, shrugging his shoulders. I don't understand how you can put up with that sneak, that nasty fizz. <sighs> How can you live here? The atmosphere is stifling and unclean. Do you call yourselves schoolmasters, teachers? You are paltry government clerks. You keep not a temple of science, but a department of red tape and lawyer behavior, and it smells as sour as a police station. No, my friends, I will stay with you for a while, and then I will go to my farm, and there catch crabs and teach little Russians. I shall go, and you can stay here with your Judas, damn his soul.
Kovalenko is not willing to follow the same rules that the town has fallen into. Uh, it all comes to an open conflict when Belikov tries to impose his worldview upon him. And it comes to a direct physical confrontation. But that's not what brings Belikov down. It's Varya's love, the humiliation of it. And we do not see Kovalenko in the story after this stairs incident. Varya gets a brief mention at the funeral that shows Chekhov's view on the women once again. Varinka too was at the funeral, and when the coffin was lowered into the grave, she burst into tears. I have noticed that little Russian women are always laughing and crying, no intermediate word. But Kabalenka is gone from the story, as he is likely gone from the suffocating town, because Belikov himself was just a symptom of the problem. The townspeople are the disease because they complied. The thought uh, is picked up by the narrator's companion, Ivan Ivanovich. He interrupts the story with his remarks a few times during the narration, but it all comes to a peak at the story's end. The narrator, Borkin, repeats multiple times that people like Belikov, they exist. They have always existed. They're not going away and it's perfectly fine trying to excuse his own complacency. You endure insult and humiliation and dare not openly say that you are on the side of the honest and the free. And you lie and smile yourself. And all of that for the sake of the crust of bread, for the sake of a warm corner, for the sake of the wretched little worthless rank in the service. No, one can't go on living like this. Ivan Ivanovich disagrees. He says that a person needs to stand up against it. Because the problem, it seems, is not just that Belikov lives in a case and succumbed the whole town to the same fate. It's that they obeyed. One person that holds no power whatsoever, a teacher of ancient Greek, has succumbed an entire town to obey him and made them fearful of doing anything that he would be disapproving of. Borkin is still under his influence. He's also in a case. Look at how the two characters are first introduced to us. Ivan Ivanovich, a tall, lean, old fellow with long mustaches, was sitting outside the door, smoking a pipe in the moonlight. Borkin was lying within on the hay and could not be seen in the darkness. He narrates from the darkness the entire time. We are only given his physical description once he's finished the story and exits the barn. That's when we're given the description of the stillness of the night and all of that. But that's when also Ivan Ivanovich starts to talk about how living in a lie is also a case. And Borkin interrupts him and goes back into the darkness. A sidebar, the translation actually stumbles a little bit here. If you like, I will tell you a very edifying story. No, it's time we were asleep, said Birkin. Tell it tomorrow. Birkin sa actually says till tomorrow, i.e. he does not really want to hear the story. He just cuts him off. That's supported by the later line. Well, you are off on another track now, Ivan Ivanovich, said the schoolmaster. Let us go to sleep. He does not want to hear the Ivan Ivanovich uh, story because it's going to disagree with his worldview. That, thus, he cuts him off. And as Ivan Ivanovich wants to continue, Borkin cuts him off and goes back to sleep. Ivan Ivanovich, however, cannot sleep. Uh, he adds it, exits the barn, sits down, and starts to smoke. And it's such a beautiful visual play by Chekhov here that he's so well known for. It works on different levels. Look at how characters are positioned. Ivan Ivanovich cannot even stay cooked up to sleep in the end, thus beautifully translating his worldview. This comical, satirical story of Belikov is nicely framed with commentary on non-complacency, knowing what you stand for, not falling victim to others and breaking free. Look at the different meaning of case. This narrative device creates a case around Belikov's story. A case within a case within a case. So let's switch gears and talk plays then, yeah? The copy that I have here, that's uh, Chekhov's plays, the four famous ones, obviously, The Seagull, Uncle Vanya, The Three Sisters, and The Cherry Orchard. Uh, this was published in uh, 1969, so that coincides with my dad's uh, high school years, so this one would have been bought for him for his high school. He wrote these four plays quite late in his life. He had an unsuccessful experience with plays early on in early in 1980s, when his first play, Ivanov, bombed at the theater, and the two others, The Bear and The Wood Demon, never made it past censure, so he kind of swore off plays for a little while. Uncle Vanya was first published and performed 
1997, but there is no conclusive evidence as to when it was actually written. The play is a reworking of one of his first plays, The Wood Demon. It carries the similar outline, but The Wood Demon had more um, secondary characters and also had different endings for the main characters. Some themes from The Wood Demon not only migrated into Uncle Vanya, but also into The Three Sisters and The Cherry Orchard. The play received mixed reviews. We can understand that Chekhov was way ahead of his time, really. Before him, the plays required a lot of plots. The events need, needed to happen, and the conflict was quite rooted in the events happening on stage. Chekhov prefers to look within. His conflict is internal more often than not. And there is not much going on on stage, really. That actually drove critics up the wall because they said, like, nothing is happening. Characters are talking at each other, but nobody's listening. But some did actually see back then that Chekhov stumbled upon something here. It's not always about the sad pieces and loud proclamations. It, it, it is more in the subtle stuff, in the nuances, in the themes. Everyday life doesn't always have this grand conflict. The villain does not always get punished. And really, even differentiating between the villains and the good guys is not always possible in real life. And sometimes it's just people who go through life without changing, without learning anything, and nothing changes. And that's actually something that we see in Uncle Vanya. Uncle Vanya tells a story of a family. A retired professor Serebrikov uh, returns with his wife to a family estate that used to belong to his first wife, now occupied by his daughter from that first marriage named Sofia, and the late wife's uh, brother named Ivan Vainitsky. Vanyeski has become disillusioned with his uh, brother-in-law, whom he used to admire greatly. Uh, between himself and Sofia, they used to manage the estate and send money to Serebrikov to St. Petersburg. But ever since the professor has installed at the estate, everybody is rather catatonic and idle, and nothing is happening at the estate. The family has a constant visitor, a doctor named Astrov, whom um, Sofia has fallen in love with, but he's not that interested in her, but he seems to have taken a fancy to Serebrikov's wife, Yelena. We're also to understand that Ivan might be also in love with Yelena. Sofia tries to hint at her feelings to Astrov, but he ignores her. So then she confides in Yelena, and Yelena offers to talk to Astrov on her behalf. Astrov clearly states that he's not interested in Sofia, so Yelena asks him not to torture the poor girl and not to return. He agrees, but instantly asks her to meet him somewhere else, and despite her feeble denial, he kisses her. Ivan interrupts them, and Yelena runs off, mumbling something about going away. In the third act, Serebrikov gathers a family meeting and suggests that in order to improve his financial state, they should sell the estate. Vanitsky loses it. Uh, he spent his whole life managing the estate and now Serebrikov wants to throw him out. Uh, they argue as they go off stage into the different room. A series of gunshots is heard. Um, Vanitsky shot at Serebrikov but missed. In the fourth act, Serebrikov and Vainitsky make up. Serebrikov takes Yelena and leaves to leave somewhere else, and Sofia and Ivan are left back at the estate. Even with the shots fired, there is not much going on events-wise. The conflict is entirely interpersonal, but more importantly, internal. The themes in this one are love and family, labor and sloth, uh, ideals and the crush of them, ecology, weirdly, uh, also sorrow and hopelessness. The love triangle, and I'm even hesitant to call it that, because the love that the characters are feeling is either out of boredom, obligation or desperation. Astrov, infused with a lot of Chekhov's characteristics, does not notice a plain and hard-working Sofia, because apparently he's seen it all and is bored out of, of all of it. But he also wants to strike up this affair with a beautiful Yelena, but seemingly also out of boredom, because it would give him something to do. Sofia does not have any other prospects beyond this Astrov, so she's fallen in love with him. Yelena does not seem to be interested either, but she also does not have anything to do, so it's all out of boredom. The only true love that I see is the familial one between Uncle Vanya and Sofia. 
every other character is either indifferent towards one another or they display this bastardization of love. And this boredom, this indolence is pervasive. And it's something that Chekhov heavily criticizes in most of his plays, this lifestyle that the provincial intelligentsia have chosen for themselves. They do nothing worthy with their time and their resources. In theory, people like uh, Astrov or even Uncle Vanya should be rewarded by the author because they seemingly do some good, but they either don't do enough or they don't do it for the right reasons. The only truly worthy thing that Chekhov seemingly approves of is the work that Astrov does in planting trees, because it's going to be worthy and valuable to generations to come. This theme of saving and helping nature survive from the wood demon, it also can be seen in the Three Sisters and the Cherry Orchard. The destruction of the Cherry Orchard is all about the nostalgia and the longing for the lifelong lost. Here, the destruction of the forest and the clearing of the forest speaks to the ecological impact, but also the sociological impact, because according to Astrov and Chekhov in turn, when there is no beautiful scenery around, there can be no happy people. And is anyone truly happy in this story? Our main character, our uncle Vanya Ivan Vainitsky, is not, although seemingly he used to be. His newly found disillusionment with a brother-in-law has shown him that he's wasted his entire life. He believed that the labor he was putting in went to a good cause that the hardships that he had to suffer through along with his niece uh, Sofia were warranted. And now, not only does he see that Serebrikov is nothing special, really, he's not smart, he's less than ordinary, but he also does not care for the estate. He not, does not care for Sofia, he does not care for Ivan. At the end, Ivan contemplates that he has another 13 years to live, give or take, but he has nothing to live for, because his ideals were crushed so harshly. The only hope that he has, at least according to Astrov, is beyond the grave. But we, you and I, have but one hope. The hope that we may be visited by visions, perhaps by pleasant ones, as we lie resting in our graves. The play seems to pose that it doesn't really matter whether or not you've worked your whole life, you still end up unhappy. We have this representation of indolence in Serebrikov, whose entire work has amounted to nothing. He cannot support himself. He relies on the income from the estate that really belongs to his daughter. And we have this Yelena who has no ambition, he, who's openly lazy. She even, she's even too lazy to get into an affair. In juxtaposition, Vainitsky and Sofia tell us that they used to work quite hard and will work once again once Serebrikov leaves. And it's not even that we don't get to see that, which could be quite sus, but if we, even if we trust them on this, the problem is that it doesn't really matter. Not a single person is happy. And that's what rendered me catatonic, this last monologue from Sofia. What can we do? We must live our lives. Yes, we shall live, Uncle Vanya. We shall live through the long procession of days before us, and through the long evenings. We shall patiently bear the trials that fate imposes on us. We shall work for others without rest, but now, and when we are old, and when our last hour comes, we shall meet it humbly, and there, beyond the grave, we shall say that we have suffered and wept, that our life was bitter, and God will have pity on us. And then, dear, dear uncle, we shall see the bright and beautiful life, we shall rejoice and look back upon our sorrow here, a tender smile, and we shall rest. I have faith, uncle, fervent, passionate faith. We shall rest. We shall rest. We shall hear the angels. We shall see heaven shining like a jewel. We shall see all evil and our pain sink away in the great compassion that shall enfold the world. Our life will be as peaceful and tender, as sweet as a caress. I have faith. I have faith. My poor, poor Uncle Vanya, we are crying. You have never known what happiness was, but wait, Uncle Vanya, wait. We shall rest. We shall rest. We shall rest. There is so much hopelessness to it, so much despair. It's tearing me up apart. It sits heavy on my chest and doesn't let me breathe. Chekhov paints a picture of a life where nothing changes. None of your actions matter. You can be as virtuous or as sinful as you wish. You still end up so, so crushingly unhappy. Uncle Vanya and Sofia have wasted their lives on the wrong ideals. 
and now their only hope is beyond the grave. Uh, make better choices, kids. Chekhov's plays reads incredibly depressing. At least they do for me. The state he puts you in, this catatonic thing where nothing changes, people talking without listening, they're talking at each other, not to each other. And what's the point of it all? It's obviously a critic of the provincial intelligentsia that does nothing and just wastes their lives. But here in the 21st century, we have something to learn from it as well. How many of us have put stake on the wrong ideal? How many have clung to the symbols of the past out of nostalgia to escape the uncertainty of the future? How many say that they want to change their lives, but it never goes beyond words? How many live in the case of our own making? How many change colors in order to serve our own needs, as a chameleon would? Read Chekhov and reflect. Well, that got way too preachy at the end there. Mm -hmm.